Hey, Northside women, this is Tika Skulls, and I'm so glad you are joining us for our first Rewind episode. We are going to be talking today about chapters 1 through 10, and so if you have not listened to those or read those already, you can pause here and go back and listen to chapters 1 through 10 being read by Rhonda Murphy, and it will take very little bit of your time, maybe 30, 40 minutes to hear um, all 10 chapters. And so we do encourage you to do that today before we start. But if you have read and uh, you have some questions of your own, we do too, right ladies? Like there's there's lots of questions that we have after reading uh, 10 chapters of Exodus. And um, we are, uh, first of all, I just want to um, have everybody introduce themselves so we all know their voices and our voices and um, as we discuss, um, and then we'll start digging into our chapters. So Rhonda, why don't you start? Okay, I am Rhonda Murphy, and you've heard my voice if you've listened to the first 10 (laughs) chapters of uh, Exodus, so um, I will probably sound about the same. (laughs) (laughs) And we thank you for reading. Um, I know you said that you were reading like you were reading uh, the storybook to your kids. I did. And we appreciate that. That was awesome. Your voice of Pharaoh was very convincing. Well, thank you. I was like, I hope it wasn't too dramatic. But I I remembered sitting on the couch with my kids when we were homeschooling and reading to them. and And I sort of fell into that, you know, that cadence of trying to keep them interested absolutely it was convincing and and pharaoh and you know the lord i am (laughs) was you've got to get you got to get get resonance absolutely absolutely well we appreciate it it was it was fantastic thank you i'm Catherine mackerel and um summarizing chapters one through ten today and glad to be here i'm marcia stevenson Fantastic. <laughs> Marsha's just happy to be here. Yes. She's just happy to be here. Maybe. I don't know. But, <laughs> but no, we are um, just going to be talking about um, chapters 1 through 10, giving you, um, like Catherine said, kind of a summary, but then also how to, um, maybe just a little bit of comprehension, how to apply some of the things to our lives, maybe seeing some themes throughout. There's Who knows what else we will uncover today. Uh, but I do want to let you know, that we were talking before we started recording that Exodus is such a pivotal book of the Bible. Um, it is a, um, in my uh, She Reads Truth Bible, it says Exodus is the high point of redemptive history in the Old Testament. Many patterns and concepts from Exodus are revisited elsewhere in Scripture, especially in the past, present, and future work of Jesus. Uh, from deliverance and provision to God's glory and presence, the themes of Exodus find their fulfillment in Christ. And so this book, resonates all throughout the rest of scripture. We were just talking about how it even is is fulfilled in a revelation and all of that. And we'll get to that later on in the book. But I just wanted to start off with Catherine, just summarize. Uh, we're just going to do it uh, two chapters at a time. So Catherine's going to start out with a summary each time and we'll, we'll go. Sure. So beginning in chapter one, uh, coming out of Genesis, Uh, We see that the Israelites go to Egypt, there's about 70 at that point, uh, to escape the famine, and they're going in under Joseph, who is at the right hand of Pharaoh, which uh, is not an accident. God has done all of that. Um, While they're in Egypt, they're very fruitful and multiplied, um, and they were so fruitful and so, um, so multiplied that they became a threat to a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and so that Pharaoh, in order to... um, control them, he took them and enslaved them. Um, But even in enslavement and in pressure, they continued to multiply. So then Pharaoh directed the Egyptian midwives to kill the male uh, Hebrew babies in the Nile and to drown them. But there were two midwives that feared God and disobeyed Pharaoh. Uh, And so the Israelites just continued to multiply. So Pharaoh then instructed all of his people to throw every Hebrew male baby into the Nile, but let the female babies live. So that's pretty much all of chapter one. In chapter two, we get Moses being born, and he was beautiful. And so his mom hid him for the first three months of, of his life. When she could no longer hide him, she built a basket. Here's the famous story we all know. She built a basket, placed him in it, and put him in the reeds at the bank of the Nile. Um, and Mir- is it Miriam, his, his sister, mm-hmm. uh, stayed to watch, but he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, which is really interesting. And she felt sorry for him and decided to take him in. She actually ended up um, paying Moses' mom to nurse him because she needed someone to feed him. 
So, uh, and she named him Moses. There was a big time gap, and then Moses grows up. And so further in chapter 2, we see Moses grow up and identify with the Hebrew people. He sees to an Egyptian uh, mistreating a Hebrew slave, and Moses murders this guy, murders the Egyptian. And so uh, ends up becoming afraid because he's now a murderer and flees to the wilderness, flees to Midian. Um, where there he meets his wife, he has a son, and becomes a shepherd. So that's just a completely different completely different life from the palace of Pharaoh. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, the Israelites groan and cry out to God. And God, I think the word that's used in Scripture, remembers his covenant with Abraham. Good summary, Catherine. Thank you. What is it about wells and men in the Bible? Mm-hmm. That's where they, they meet their women. It's like the biblical uh-huh. water cooler. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's where everything happens. Water cooler. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's Ladies, great. if you're looking for a man, find a well. Find a well. <laughs> well, it's also neat, like in the story, like uh, Moses rescues Jethro's daughter from other shepherds. Mm-hmm. So he's like a rescuer there too, mm-hmm. which is how he got the attention and got ended up being married into that family. So That's so interesting. It is an interesting mm-hmm. story. Yeah. You see his heart for justice and like his heart for needing to kind of come in and help and lead and I don't know so interesting yeah. Marsha what do you have to say about the first two chapters lots of random things <laughs> fantastic we love <laughs> randomness so I think it's interesting that and and obviously important that it specifies the Bible specifies that only 70 people entered Egypt but they very quickly multiplied to millions um, and then we know that as Catherine just told us, the, the new pharaoh um, was bothered by that. I mean, he was afraid of him. Like, that, the whole thing was born of fear. Um, I kind of wonder, what does it mean that he did not know Joseph? But we don't really know. Um, I did a little bit of research, and there's lots of different thoughts on that. You know, Stephen spoke to the, when he was giving the history of the Israelite people before he was stoned. He spoke of... Amorite Pharaoh who had come in who was different he he and I did a little bit of research too about the Greek word uses usage yeah. of the word and he used the form hetero which means the same but different so like if you're going to use a pen if you pen runs out of ink and you want the same one mm-hmm. same type you would use one type of Greek of word and then if you wanted a, a writing implement but not the exact same kind of writing implement you would use hetero which would be so he was pharaoh in the sense that he was king mm-hmm. but not in the same way that other so most likely he was not the son of a pharaoh before him right. so right. whether there was not a pharaoh that there was no son there was no you know something okay but um so and that, that's one of the things that's so fascinating to me is how the the scripture proves scripture right you know because we we know okay here's the pharaoh talking about pharaoh in in uh exodus and how stephen all these years later is saying yeah he wasn't the same because he was this and and then we speak and i see in isaiah it talks about the amorite pharaoh so there's different three different in- instances that show us that this pharaoh was different than the other pharaoh. Interesting. Before, yeah. 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 Well, my so. Bible brings up um, people known as the Hyksos, Hyksos, Semitic foreigners of Egypt who took over and ruled Lower Egypt. Mm-hmm. So that's a possibility. But either way, he didn't know Joseph right. and his story mm-hmm. and how he. Um, basically but save the whole region enough to point it out right like, <laughs> right i think about like like our president like it changes yeah. so it's mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. office but we all know there's very different personalities that fill that office Absolutely. and so mm-hmm. that have very different points of view and so um maybe it was something along those lines it makes me think of just someone who who came in from the outside because mm-hmm. joseph i mean you think about they gave joseph and his family goshen i mean they gave him this the prizes the land that there was in Egypt at the time and but then all of a sudden boom well they don't know about that so it just seems like to me that someone from the outside it's not your normal way of lineage of, yeah it makes you want to take Egyptian history that not like a little no. bit a little bit <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little maybe a little bit maybe. we would like 
to understand that. <laughs> yes, but exactly. I'm not sure I'm ready for hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, you don't yeah, want to no, understand that. No, I'm good. <laughs> but what also mm-hmm. is interesting is all of this was laid out in Genesis 15 because it yeah. says, Then the Lord said to Abram, to Abram, mm-hmm. know this for certain, your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. However, I will judge the nation they... Uh, serve and afterward they will go out with many possessions so you know it makes you it makes me maybe not everyone but it makes me say okay you knew this was going to happen why do we have to go through 400 years of slavery right i've asked the same question absolutely that's that is hard for us to understand yeah But haven't we asked that in our own personal lives? Sure. Is like, yes, Lord, I see your truth that yes, you know, all, you know, Romans 8, 28, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, everything will, will come to, to be good for, for me and for his glory. And but yet I still have to go through this. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of it, I don't want to be here. Right. Like, and we don't yeah. always get to see the good. That's right. In the moment. Like we may not see the good until we get to eternity, because you look at this situation. There were Israelites that were born and died in slavery. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they didn't see the they deliverance. See I don't obviously know the answer to that, but jumping ahead just a little bit in chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of the land. So God is showing his strong hand. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's at this point is his seems to be the purpose for this, is to show... Mm-hmm his strength to show his power yeah absolutely that's good that's good well marcia what are some other things that you wanted to point out um the midwives yes (laughs) (laughs) women Women are so important here so Mm -hmm. important always Always, but um, I mean, and they and they weren't hebrew but for some reason they did fear god enough to not obey pharaoh and because of that, we have Moses. Yeah, so interesting. And they were like, you know, look, like they it happened so fast. We can't get there in time, you know, to do anything about it. I love that yeah. because I'm sure, like, that's not quite a lie. But you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like, they were just yeah. talking to a man. Uh-huh. Yeah. So he's right. like, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to discuss that anymore. Okay, yeah, I'll just take what you tell me and assume yes. it's true. Um, and he and Pharaoh is so worried about the males i don't know why i hadn't really thought about this before but i found it fascinating from the knowing faith podcast um that he was worried about the males um because that was taking away the israelites future yes Mm -hmm. Yes. i mean obviously but i just hadn't thought of it that way the the lands and the titles and um the birthrights and everything go through the male line and so if the males are killed then all of that has nowhere to go so it goes to the egyptians i guess so then they take over all of that well and practically a a generation of women is a whole lot more easier to control physically than a generation of men Mm -hmm. that's true i hadn't thought about that that's very true but then how entertaining that he's so worried about the men that he doesn't worry about the women and the women are the one who make sure the babies are still born and then it's his own daughter that brings him into the palace (laughs) that disobeys oh this must be a hebrew baby yeah and that she knew he was a hebrew baby but yeah she was like he's coming in the house like that i don't know why that's never hit me before Mm -hmm. until this reading and this listening of it and i was just like Wait, she disobeyed a king, like the Pharaoh's order. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that was her dad. Well, and the irony of Pharaoh raising the deliverer. Yes! Yeah. Like, but he may not have lived in the palace. That's oh, what I read. Okay. He may not have lived in the palace He because there would have been lots of harems and whatever. It's not necessarily true that he got the education and all that kind of stuff. But okay. he was still nearby. Yeah. And it was still part of Pharaoh's family yes. that preserved the deliverer, mm-hmm. which was exactly what opposite of what Pharaoh was trying to accomplish. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> which is all God. Mm-hmm. So interesting. I also read in, in some of the uh, studies that I did that the, the um, Hebrew word that's used for the basket that Moses was put in mm-hmm. is the exact same Hebrew yes. word that's used for the ark. Yes. And right. Noah. Mm-hmm. And so uh-huh. it's just such a uh-huh. – it's another picture of yes. deliverance. And I think that's super cool. That's so. amazing. I do want to point out the end of chapter two before we move on. 
uh, because we've been in chapter with two chapters <laughs> for a long time. But this is setting the stage. This is setting the foundation. It says, after a long time, the king of Egypt died. This is in uh, verse 23 of chapter 2. And the Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites, and God knew. And I want to point out those four things that it was God heard, God remembered, God saw, God knew. Um, and that it's the same even today. Like he hears us, he remembers us, he sees us, and he knows us. Um, and he knows all the things that are going on in our life. Um, and there is a purpose in the what feels like 400 years of slavery, right? right? And so it's just good to remember that. So I think a good question is, why does it say God remembered? I mean, did he forget? Actually, did you listen to that podcast? Episode? Maybe. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? <laughs> it's really cool. Um, well, what I wrote down... Um, is that that was part of the language of accommodation so that it's a way that we can understand it. In, in human terms. Yes, in yes. human terms. Um, but that it, for him, it was more like, okay, now it's time. Yeah, God didn't actually need to remember anything. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. But He's not like me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank goodness. Now, I want y'all to, we've, you've referred to this podcast um, that you've been talking about. So tell us a little bit about it before we move on, because we do want to make sure that people know that that is a resource that they can go and listen yeah. to more depth. And we'll link it in the show notes. So that's the Knowing Faith podcast with Jen Wilkin, um, JT English, and Kyle Worley. Worley? I, I think, think that's so. right. Yeah. Um, it's it's very knowledgeable, but also entertaining. <laughs> they are very much like siblings and pick at each other, but know a whole lot more than we do. And so we learn a lot. <laughs> and they are going through the entire book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. right and now. they are looking at it from a standpoint of, of seeing patterns. Mm -hmm. So um, themes and themes mm -hmm. that occur in Exodus that we see in other places in the Bible. And mm -hmm. they point out some things that I have never seen before that are beautiful mm -hmm. about God's story. Yep. And it is a fascinating listen. So I know uh, to me, like I first thought a theology podcast, that's like watching paint dry. <laughs> but no, I actually no. found myself really enthralled mm -hmm. by it. It's Absolutely. very interesting. So. so interesting. That's great. All right. Um, Can I add one more thing please. real quick? Just as as we're going through the entire chapter of Exodus, it's good to keep in mind that there are types, and I put types in quotation marks throughout the whole book. And a type in the Bible is a person or event in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or event in the New Testament. Okay. So when you look at it in that in those terms, to me, it, it really brings the story, the events alive. Um, Egypt is the world, okay? Pharaoh is Satan, who has our adversary. Moses is God's appointed deliverer, which is, so Moses is a type of Christ. And uh, Israel is, is us, we are the believer. Now, those are the four main uh, types. Now mm -hmm. you can break it down even further when you start looking at you know the burning bush and you look at at these other things. But but when you look at it from that way, those four main types to me really you know they just bring kind of bring it to life mm -hmm. because you can put yourself in there without being egocentric you know right. uh, in the Bible. But because we know God is the same, He's He's the same as He was then. He's the same. When Christ was, you know, alive and he or on Earth, and he's the same that he is today. So when you see the way he handles redemption and the way he handles the adversary and the way he handles the Israelites, it's the same for us today. That's great. That's really good. So so cool. So cool. All right. I'm just moving on to Exodus three and four. Chapter three. So chapter three is really a pivotal chapter in the story. Um, so the Israelites are crying out in Egypt. Meanwhile, in the wilderness, Moses is shepherding and sees um, a burning bush, and interestingly, at the base of Mount Sinai, where he's going to come back to, um, that is not consumed. M uh, Moses goes to investigate. God calls to Moses and makes himself known and reveals his deliverance plan um, for the Israelites to Moses uh, and tells Moses that um, 
that he is God's chosen person to lead his people out of Egypt. And then we get into a real interesting dialogue uh, where Moses asks two big questions, who am I and who are you? And when he asks, who am I, uh, God says, my presence will be with you. And when he says, well, who are you? <laughs> we get God's first like name, I am who I am. This is my name forever, which is where we get Yahweh, which is my understanding that that's a form of a Hebrew word to be. God always has been, he is, and he always will be. Um, so God then finishes up the chapter by telling Moses what to say, do, and what's going to happen. And we go into chapter four and we get Moses' questions. Um, what if they don't believe me? God gives him uh, three signs. One, to throw his staff down and have it become a snake and then touch the tail and have the snake become a staff again. Uh, his diseased hand in and out of his cloak and then water from the Nile to become blood when poured on dry ground. Moses keeps going, but I'm not eloquent in speech, right? Um, God says, I will teach you what to say, and then Moses finally gets real honest, and he says, please send someone else. Um, which I identify with that. Mm -hmm. God becomes angry, but God provides. He gives Moses Aaron to speak for him. Uh, Moses returns to Egypt, and God tells him again what will happen. On the way back, Moses' son has to be circumcised in accordance with the original Abrahamic covenant. Um, Aaron meets Moses. They go to the Israelite elders, perform the signs that God gave them um, with Aaron speaking, and the Israelites believe in the plan, and they worship God. All right, so yeah, so here we see... God speaks to Moses. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, just the burning bush, you know, in itself. Like we've heard, you know, most of us have probably heard that story and know that it's flame of fire within a bush, but the bush is not burning up. So that's a miracle in itself. And then you hear Moses, Moses. <laughs> I'm not going to do as great a job as <laughs> you gotta Rhonda get deeper. You does gotta get deeper. As, the, as God's voice. Um, but he calls him by name, which I think that is so pivotal, you know, twice. twice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So first off, I just think it's very relatable that Moses sees a bush on fire, but it's not burning up and is like, ooh, let me get closer. <laughs> check this out <laughs> um but then the whole conversation back and forth um i don't i, I, I read it and I, I just think like okay i'm seeing like god rolling his eyes and okay now this okay now that will you please stop okay <laughs> but it's also so gracious and compassionate to understand his concerns and the lord knew he'd have those right. concerns before mm -hmm. and he still used before him before even calling his right. name right <clears throat> absolutely he knew who he was calling <laughs> when he yeah. called yeah i think it's it's amazing that god gives us the plan of redemption right here you know he for us for them you know when you look at exodus in uh, 3 7 and 8 he has seen the misery of his people he's heard them crying mm -hmm. he knows their suffering he will come down to rescue. So good. He will bring them out of the land of Egypt. Remember, Egypt is a type of the world. So he will bring them out and into God's land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, is that not what he has promised for us? Absolutely. It's exactly what he's promised for us. So, I mean, God is the same. He is the same as he always has been. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is just such a comfort to me. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful picture. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know. And the I am statement, you could, we could do three podcasts on the I am mm -hmm. statement. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, not just I, I have always been, but I am eternal, which is, you know, we can't even fathom, I can't even, mm -hmm. I don't want to speak for anybody we, else, we. but <laughs> I, I can't fathom something that has no beginning and no end. How do you fathom something that has no beginning? What does that even we, we don't have anything to compare that mm -hmm. to. We don't have anything in our lives that that is on this earth or that we have ever experienced other than the living God of not having a beginning. No, he is completely other, and we mm -hmm. forget that. Yeah. Because yeah. we tend, because all we know is, is our human experience, and so 
I'm very guilty of this, and thank goodness the Lord corrects me, but I'm very guilty of imagining him within the concept of things I've experienced in my life, yeah. and that's not true. We, mm-hmm. we want to put him in a box. That's right. In a box that mm-hmm. looks like the box that we would be in, and it's, it's, it's not the same, and, it's, and then I have the audacity to question. Yeah. I mean, please. I, it's... it's overwhelming to me to think about it when you start thinking about how how could he predict what was going to happen in Genesis what was going to happen in Exodus however many hundred years later and the only way he can do that is because the fact that he is outside of time which we have again no concept of how right. we yeah. because we measure everything in time mm-hmm. I feel like God's, God's given us time to to order us mm-hmm. sure right he doesn't need time right. right and he can be here and he can be there he at is. the same time yeah. and he is you know so it's mm-hmm. it's it makes your brain hurt it makes your brain hurt <laughs> yes. and that i am statement like i said we could we could spend so much time just mm-hmm. time on just trying to wrap our brain around mm-hmm. and still we would never we'd never really truly be able to understand it mm-hmm. so yeah. My, my Bible here says, it is not that God's name is actually I am, but that Yahweh reveals something about the essence of who God is, an essence that relates to the concept of being and to the idea of one who brings others into being. That's yeah. that's similar to what, I don't even think if I repeated that six times, I would understand. Oh, <laughs> that's similar to what uh, I have uh, from the Amplified Bible. is related to the name of God, Yahweh rendered Lord, which is derived from the verb H-A-Y-A-H to be. Mm-hmm. So, again, that falls in line with everything we've been talking about. Every form that we could imagine, he fulfills, and even those beyond what we can imagine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's so um, <laughs> important. Even starting in chapter or verse 7 of chapter 3, that God starts um, revealing himself to who he is to Moses – um, and he, you know, talked about what kind of what Rhonda had mentioned. That I've, I've seen, I've heard, I know, I've come down to rescue them. I love that verse in verse eight. I've come down, and then he, you know, he tells them all of these things, and um, because the Israelites cry has come to me, I've seen the way. The, and and therefore, in verse ten, which you always need to look for, there, what, what is that? Therefore, um, so look at the previous verses before that. Therefore, go. <laughs> He's like, because of who I am. And my presence will be with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You you go. Because of who I am, you go. He doesn't say anything about who Moses is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't say anything about, well, you're a human and you're going to have all these. No. He just says, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Um so that you may lead my people out of Egypt. And so the Israelites, and he's very specific who that is. And so, of course, Moses is like, who am I? <laughs> like, are you kidding? You have just described who you are. So humbly, I believe Moses is saying, who am I to do this? This is a big task, Lord. Like, I'm just a shepherd, you know? Um, and the Lord doesn't pep him up with a positive self, no, self-talk not. speech at all, which is... The opposite of what we see in our culture. He says, I will be with you. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we have that same, through the Holy Spirit, we have that same promise today. That's right. I am with you. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's beautiful that we can relate in that way. Absolutely. When we're called to do something, which we often are, that feels outside of our capabilities. Absolutely. And again, like any question, the Lord reminds him, who of who he is you know of who of God's characteristics who he is and then when he says you know I am who I am when you look into the book of John when Jesus was on earth um what that whenever Jesus I don't know if y'all have read this when I was younger and I was reading scripture I was like you know Jesus just said like I am the good shepherd or I am you know and like what's the big deal all of these you know Pharisees are getting like all hyped up about this and <laughs> wanting to kill him and like he's just saying who you know but he's referring to himself as Yahweh which is a big deal right. and so that's what Jesus is saying is like I am Yahweh I am the same God <laughs> it was a statement of his divinity yes, yes. Yeah. That was a big deal and still is, of course, today. And so this was, I mean, again, like what Rhonda was saying earlier, 
this continues on through scripture um, and and God just continues here to reveal himself over and over and over to Moses and to his people um, and it's just how gracious of God to do that he didn't have to he could just say I am who I am you need to do it and move on but he doesn't he doesn't do that at all his compassion and that he continues to tell Moses and the Israelites who he is um, and and um, and just moving him to do what he wants them to do I think also that he shows in fire. So to us, I mean, fire is warmth, but we have electricity, so we don't think about fire being light. Mm -hmm. But that's how they would have experienced Mm -hmm. light. And then you take it to the I am statements, I am the light of the world Mm -hmm. in the New Testament. And then the fire by night. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the beautiful parallel symmetry in all those stories. Fire also represents judgment. In, in the Bible, too. And so when you look at the bush that was burning in the judgment of the fire, but was yet not consumed by the fire, that's another picture of God's mercy, God's mm-hmm. grace, because we, we are not, we're not consumed by the, the judgment of fire as we would be without, you know, His grace and His mercy. All right, well, let's move on to chapters 5 and 6. Pharaoh gets into the picture. So Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh and tell him they need a three-day trip to the wilderness to worship God and make sacrifices. And Pharaoh (laughs) says, who is the Lord? Get back to work, in so many words. Um, (laughs) They experience further oppression. They are no longer given straw to make their bricks, but the same amount of work is required. Their foremen are beaten. Um, Moses and Aaron, now that they're Israelites confront Moses and Aaron um, like basically what are you trying to do for us you've just made life worse and Moses goes back and questions God that is chapter 5 chapter 6 God again speaks to Moses reaffirming the Israelites deliverance from Pharaoh and tells Moses again what to say to the Israelites this time the Israelites don't believe him because of their broken spirits and hard labor Mm -hmm. So God sends Moses to Pharaoh again. Moses um, questions God again because he's a poor speaker, so he's, he's very much fixated on that. Um, God instructs Moses and Aaron again, so much patience, uh, with the commands for both the Israelites and Pharaoh. And then we get genealogy. We get the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Um, and then at the end of the chapter, Moses questions God again uh, because he is a poor speaker, so we see. Um, a recurring theme with Moses. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that it gets harder before it gets better. Yes. Like it's the opposite of what you would yes. expect necessarily. I, I, as an Israelite, I would think you would be like, all right, Moses is here. Mm-hmm. He's here let's to, go. yes, let's do it. <laughs> and then you're like, my work just got harder. Yeah. And wait a second. Yeah. But haven't we all been in that position? Notice how in, in in verse one of chapter five, he doesn't. He's not really a hundred percent truthful about what they really want at this point. <laughs> you know, I've let's, seen that. Let's let's let them go. We want to go out and have a feast. We're back in three days, okay? Yep. Can we get, go have a feast? And and I kind of did a little study on this, and some people believe it was to show the hardness and the unreasonableness of Pharaoh's heart, okay. because you know he's not he's not even willing to let them take take a three day weekend to go to the mountains. You know, I mean, they just they just want to go to Gallimber for a few days, and then they're come back. Want to go to a retreat? Yes, we do and, it every year. And yes. he's like, no, and it makes him so mad just the asking of it that they they gotta add you know they gotta go hunt their own straw and then notice who the israelites cry out to Mm. when they have to make the same amount of bricks they cry out to pharaoh they don't cry out to god Mm. Mm. so they're still they still don't get it they're mad at moses and they cry out to pharaoh Mm -hmm. for relief have it in it's an enslaved mindset which that's the mindset you yes. would have if you've been right. a slave your right. entire exactly. life and yeah. your grandparents were slaves and your great-grandparents and right. mm-hmm. absolutely it's understandable all right let's move on to chapter seven and eight so chapter seven we again see god reassuring and instructing moses telling him about pharaoh uh, rejecting his message 
Uh, so Moses and Aaron obey. God tells Moses and Aaron to perform the staff miracle with Aaron's staff, and they obey in that. Uh, the magician, magicians of Egypt, however, replicate the sign with occult power, but Aaron's staff swallows up all of the uh, magician's staffs, and Pharaoh hardens his heart. And we get to the first plague, which is the water of the Nile turned to blood, and all water reservoirs are turned to blood. Um, so Moses and Aaron obey and begin the first plague. The Egyptian magicians can replicate the same plague with occult power, which is interesting. Pharaoh hardens his heart, and the plague lasts for seven days. Then we get to chapter 8. And we get to the next plague, which is really fun. It's frogs. Frogs <laughs> everywhere. Um, Aaron stretches out his hand. The Egyptian magicians also produced frogs, which is interesting. Pharaoh asks for relief, but then changes his mind. And then we go to the third plague, which is gnats, which my understanding is these are gnats that bite. Um, so um, the Egyptian magicians could not reproduce this one. Uh, they tried, and the magicians interestingly look at Pharaoh and said, "Hey, this is this is actually God." <laughs> so they, the magicians recognize God, but Pharaoh keeps his heart hardened. Uh, and then the fourth plague at the end of chapter eight is flies. Could it get better? Um, God exempts, interestingly enough. So the Israelites have suffered through these other plagues. They do not suffer from the flies. God exempts the Israelites from this plague to show his power. Pharaoh um, relents somewhat and tells them they can worship within Egypt and then um, worship in the wilderness. But then Pharaoh hardens his heart after relief. So like he gets relief from the plague and he changes his mind. Never mind. So and that's the end of chapter 8. So we are now um, through the fourth plague. Chapter 7, verse 3. That's a hard verse. Yep. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. God hardening people's heart has been a struggle for me. You know, well, give them a chance. You know, I mean, why do you get him? But you know what? Romans 9, 14 through 18. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so I may display my power in you, and that my name will be claimed in the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he has. He wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. This, to me, is... Again, a hard verse, but when you understand God's sovereignty and God's foreknowledge of things, you know, I think you just have to say that God, God knew that regardless of what was done, mm -hmm. Pharaoh was not going to relent. God knew the outcome right. mm -hmm. of Pharaoh. So, like, I think there's right. this interplay of, and this is so hard to get your mind wrapped around i don't fully understand it but man's will and god's sovereignty and and yes both and <laughs> both things are working together mm -hmm. so i think god's using who pharaoh is right. for his purposes exactly and and if he hardens his heart it's only to display his power more mightily mm -hmm. well i want to point out too because he says i will harden pharaoh's heart but you see in this verse 13, first, however, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not listen to them. Mm -hmm. And then you see later on, Pharaoh's heart was hard. Mm -hmm. He hardened, Pharaoh hardened his own heart first over and over right. and over right. <laughs> and over until the end of the plagues where you see then the Lord saying, I'm going to harden your heart. Yeah, mm -hmm. It goes back and you see because both. It's, mm -hmm. But it's always Pharaoh hardening yeah. his own heart until the end mm -hmm. when God says, I harden his heart. Mm -hmm. right. And so so I think that's important to remember, too, in this sure. is that it's Pharaoh's action of not wanting to listen to the Lord, not wanting to, you know, um, to be an enemy mm -hmm. of the Lord. He's choosing that. And then the Lord's saying, OK, mm -hmm. you get your choice. Um Pharaoh is certainly com complicit in this. I mean, you know, that's that's right. the whole thing. Pharaoh was complicit, and, absolutely, and, and certainly not a innocent bystander. 
absolutely. by any stretch. Absolutely. It was his choice over and over mm-hmm. and over and over and over and over and over. Right. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, not even just here, yeah. what we've seen, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, he was being super hard on the Israelites, you know, for, for years before this. And then, um, and then you see the plagues um, hit and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting because did, did they not think of Pharaoh as a god? Yes. Like he mm-hmm. was viewed as, as a deity. And so you make, we don't know, but like how did Pharaoh view himself? Mm-hmm. I mean, Absolutely. So, oh, he, oh, he, he was a god. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. The yeah. hubris in this man. Yeah. yeah. And, and all of his people that he ruled over, these Egyptians, supported that. Absolutely. And so yeah. this is yeah. interesting. I mean, it's interesting identity wise from his perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, even though he did choose to reject submitting himself to God. Well, he, why would I submit right. to a to the Israel to my slaves, God? Why would I do that? Because I'm God. Right. Um, well, and two, um, do y'all want to speak to the plagues? Mm-hmm. Um, do y'all have insight into that of why these certain things? Why these certain plagues? They were Egyptian gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were all worshipped by the Egyptians. Each of the each of the plagues that were listed were all worshipped by the Egyptians. And another thing I thought interesting, the the sorcerers, the magicians, they could replicate it. They could replicate the the first few plagues, but they could not stop it. They could not reverse the plagues. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, that's a good um, point. And I, I think it would be naive to think that these were just ma- magicians in the way that we think of magicians, and of, as in sleight of hand or Mm-mm. we've got a little something going on here. I mean, these were... These were demonic, you know, occult. And it's famous. sobering, yeah. the deception power that they did possess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Can you imagine Moses when he's saying, okay, I'm going to do this great act, and then they actually replicate it? Yeah. Wait like, a second. Yeah. <laughs> like, Aaron, what just happened? <laughs> oh, now what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was my ace in the hole, I That's thought. Right. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Absolutely. That's yeah. good. All right, nine and ten. Nine and ten. So now we're into uh, the fifth plague, and they they do keep accelerating. Um, Death of livestock. So, uh, and again, this is one where God protects the Israelites' livestock from the plague, and he only afflicts the Egyptian livestock. Um, Pharaoh's heart is hard. We go to the sixth plague, which is boils. Festering boils on the people and the animals. The animals weren't uh, immune from this either, including the magicians. God did not leave them out. So, uh, and in this case, the language says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. The seventh uh, plague is hail. So God tells, uh, he's going to send a hail storm, tells Pharaoh um, that he could have eliminated all of them by now, uh, but he did not do that to show his power. God actually gives instructions in this one for the people in livestock to take shelter beforehand, Mm -hmm. which is interesting to see God's mercy even in this plague. And some do fear God, some Egyptians, and some don't. So the people that, um, and the animals and the plants that are out are struck down. Uh, the Israelites, again, are protected. Uh, Pharaoh is starting to get Pharaoh's attention. This time confesses his sin and God's righteousness, asks for relief, asks for relief and agrees to let people go. Uh, Moses tells Pharaoh, um, actually, no, you don't really fear God. Um, but Pharaoh hardens his heart again and changes his mind after the relief. And so then we get to chapter 10. Uh, the eighth plague, which locusts, fun. Uh, we're about to have cicadas. So, you know, it's probably going to be similar. Uh, so the Lord says um, he has hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he may do these miraculous signs so that they will tell and they may know that he is God. Um, yeah, and they, Moses and Aaron obey and they I have it in my notes, they eat what was left by the hail, and my brain is blank right now at the moment. But before the plague, Pharaoh relents, but limits who men can go worship. So he says, okay, the men can go, I believe, but you can't take the women and children. So God sends the locusts, uh, Pharaoh relents and confesses his sin, uh, but then once he gets relief, God, uh, God hardens Pharaoh's heart again. The ninth place is darkness, darkness which can be felt, which I think is very interesting. Um, not just nighttime. This is darkness. So they have three days of darkness so that they could not even see each other. And again, the Israelites were spared. Uh, Pharaoh relents again after the darkness, but says the herds must stay behind. He's, he's like a wheeler and dealer here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moses says, no, the herds must go for sacrifices. And um, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh threatens Moses with death if he ever sees him again. 
one of the things that I read about the plague of boils was that it you know it says take handfuls of furnace soot mm-hmm. and blow in them and it, everything it touches will get a boil. The furnace soot could have come from a an altar to a pagan god that was where they practiced child sacrifice. Wow. And um, because it talks about the there's a certain type of furnace that according the Hebrew it says I don't know Hebrew but so I'm taking someone's word for it but <laughs> um, but they talk about how that could, those the the soot could have come from a sacri- you know human sacrifice that makes sense because they did sacrifice yes. children yes, babies they mm-hmm. did yeah and how appropriate for God to use that to afflict them yeah I thought it, it was interesting um, chapter nine verse five where it says and the Lord set a time. He says, tomorrow, the Lord will do this thing in the land. Mm -hmm. And the Lord did this the next day. (laughs) I mean, like, it just falls up and says, he did what he said he was going to (laughs) do. But I just think that's so interesting, isn't it? Because we kind of talked about time, how he's outside of time. But then here, he's saying, and the Lord set a time. And so that time is for us. Right. Yeah. That's that language of accommodation again. Yes, exactly. And he's saying, he set a time. He said, I'm tomorrow, I'm going to do this. But how he did prepare them. You know, ahead of ahead of time, mm-hmm. um, and and since you know, and th- this was the death of the livestock, where it specifically talked about this and mm-hmm. the fifth plague. Mm-hmm. But I just thought that was so interesting. Um, and then another part of chapter nine, verse sixteen, um, he, you know, he talks about how for this time back in fourteen, I'm about to send my plagues against you, and by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague. Um, however. I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known on the whole earth. And if you're wondering why did the Lord allow this to happen and why, this is why. This is our answer, why. And you know what's interesting to me? I mean, it seems, these plagues seem so harsh, and they are. Yeah. But the mercy of God showing us who he is is bigger Mm -hmm. than the suffering that these plagues produced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that is mind-blowing to me like yes. when we look at suffering that we experience in our lives and and like again the romans eight twenty eight, and then romans eight twenty nine, which tells us that god's good purpose is to conform us to his image That's right. doesn't always feel good no uh, most we, of the time it does not no does i mean not. yeah and jesus suffered that's right and we suffer and but in the grand picture god's purposes are good and the good even if we can't see it now in the present, our faith, we have to have faith that the good is going to outweigh in eternity um, the things that we've suffered. The, the coming glory is nothing compared with what we've suffered That's here. Right. And uh, I think we often lose sight of that. Well, I think even um, on verse 32 of chapter 9, um, well, in verse 31 says, The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was ripe and the flax was budding, but the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed since they are later crops. That's even mercy. Mm-hmm. You know, that <laughs> that the Lord was like, okay, Egyptians, like you guys, you know, are horrendous people. <laughs> yeah, but there's provision. provision here. Mm-hmm. And in spite of that, you know, the rain, it rains on the just and the unjust, you know, that, that verse as well um, on the New Testament. But yeah, mm-hmm. but how, the, how there's mercy even shown in that. Um, and all of these plagues are just opportunities for them to see who he is, who the Lord is, um, and to like we were we were talking I think before we started the podcast of we believe you know there were Egyptians that went with the Israelites um, because they believed in the Lord and the the Hebrew God and so I think um, those midwives if they were still yes. if they were still alive they right. were in Absolutely. in the the cruise. They feared the Lord. Yes. They feared the Lord. Exactly. And so, absolutely, that's a great point. great point. Did anybody do any digging into the the last plague, the ninth plague, the darkness, and the significance of that? I did look. Because it's very yeah. interesting. So what I heard was that um, in Egyptian lore, Pharaoh went to bed every night and battled for the sun to come up the next morning. He was seen as a god, and he battled Ra. I believe, which mm-hmm. uh, Night of the Museum, wasn't he also yeah. the God of Ra? <laughs> also in Ra. that. <laughs> yes, thank mm-hmm. you. Yep. So, um, yeah, just to relate it to, like, uh, popular culture. Anyway, um, so 
so the fact that God used darkness as the last, the sun did not come up for three days, that would have sent a very clear message to Pharaoh, and that mm-hmm. would have sent that he is not God, and that That's would have right. sent a very clear message to all the Egyptians that Pharaoh is not God. And I think that is such a neat, mm-hmm. such a neat thing to know that because I didn't know that about mm-hmm. what they believed about Pharaoh. And yeah. then you see so much of the of God's wisdom, of course. God's wise, but like it just to be able to see it is really yes. amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it was says it was a darkness that could be felt, mm-hmm. which to me that indicates a supernatural darkness. Absolutely. This is not a the sun didn't come up, right? Or know, just not a, a not a, a scientific a solar eclipse, or right. you know, it's this was a light. darkness <laughs> that could be felt. And then okay, so was the light. In Goshen with the Israelites was that a supernatural light? light? I wonder that a, as well. A, you know, a Shekinah glory light. That's right. Perhaps, absolutely. You know, so um, I can't even imagine a darkness that can be felt. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you think about, you know, if you go when the electricity goes out at home at night, yes. and you know how dark it can be. Yeah. And I get freaked out about that kind of thing. I feel like somebody's yeah. looking at me, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> You've so, seen too many scary movies. Yes, I have. But um, but I can't imagine how dark and and interesting to me. So I'm thinking they didn't even see. They God blocked them from mm-hmm. seeing his light in Goshen. Mm-hmm. Because if they could see that light, then yeah. that's not darkness you can feel. Mm-hmm. So they were they mm-hmm. were cut off. Mm. Mm. What does that sound like? Yeah, you know, if you are cut off from light, cut yeah. off from. I God. think about when you go mm. into a cave. I, I don't know if we've all had this experience. You've been caving on a cave field trip with your kids or whatever, and they uh, the guy cuts the light mm-hmm. down into the cave. And it's so dark, you can't see the hand in front of your face. Mm-hmm. You got no orientation. I hate at that all. part. Mm-hmm. Yes, because it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it takes away <clears throat> any visual cues at all, yeah. mm-hmm. and it's so disorienting. And that's seconds. And this lasted for three, three days. days. Right. Think about what else was three days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. something about that. Yeah. And that's what I love about studying scripture is that you cannot mine the riches of God's word. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, you can read Exodus the rest of your life over and over and over and still never get all of it out. Um, I, I think it's very pivotal at the end of chapter 10, verse 29. As you have said, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. I just think that is just like dun dun dun, you know. Like yeah. here we go, you know. <laughs> Setting us so, up for the next thing. Moses is like, all right, here's my exit. You know, yeah. my mic drop moment. Yeah. <laughs> of like, yeah. all right, as you want it, this yeah. you know, God's gonna do it. God's gonna take care of you. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I mean, as you know, as we know the story, we we know we were like, okay, Moses, you're doing, you know, you're doing well. Um, Think about how his confidence yes. like must have grown as. He's walking out God's story and he's seeing God work. Yeah. Well, and his confidence grows just in these these first ten chapters. You know, the, how how much how many times in those first three chapters did he say, "I can't do this. I can't Absolutely. do this. I got to have Aaron. He's got to do all the talking." And then all of a sudden, it's it's Moses going to Pharaoh. Yeah. Moses doing the talking. Moses, you know. That's so right. even if it's just you know, it's a little bit like Peter there. You know, Absolutely. getting his confidence and. Not necessarily in himself, but learning to say, hey, God's going to do exactly what he's going to do. I'm just a mouthpiece. That's you know, right. I'm just I'm just the one here that he's speaking through. It's not me. You know, and isn't it interesting that like way back in Moses' story where he murders the Egyptian who is like he's del- trying to deliver his people there mm-hmm. as a deliverer, but he's not like ready to be the deliverer yet. Mm-hmm. And he has to go through. 40 years in the wilderness, um, which is the first time. The first time he gets to do it again. Mm-hmm. That's a long life, y'all. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a lot of wilderness. Um, but it's it's interesting to see, like you said, you had a heart for, for justice and for deliverance. And it's interesting to see God must have cultivated that in him Absolutely. for these purposes. Absolutely. And that's really neat. 
All right, well, Northside women, I have greatly enjoyed this. I hope you have too. And um, we are looking forward to the next 10 chapters and the reading over the next few weeks. Um, and then we'll do another rewind with a, another group of, of ladies. And um, I know that this has probably turned up more questions than, than you have answers for. But if you do have questions, please let us know. We would love to be able to, to help individually uh, answer those for you and in research. Um, these ladies love their research. So uh, thank you all so much for, for being, being with, with us today, today, ladies. We appreciate it greatly. Thank you. And thank, thank you all for listening. And we love you and we will see you soon.